Hey folks, welcome to this new series on PyTorch. So I was debating what series to start after the last one uh, on quantum computing, and I thought let's go back to the basics. And uh, I haven't done, right, or I haven't made any videos about deep learning in a while, so let's do that. And um, so I was debating which framework to use, and as you all probably know, the two main ones are PyTorch and TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is what I specialize in. I know it in and out, so I thought I might as well make on PyTorch. That way I'll get to um, familiarize myself with the intricacies of PyTorch. I can read PyTorch code, but uh, I'm not super comfortable typing it out. Well, I mean, if you know one framework, you know them all, but um, it's just that I haven't worked a lot in PyTorch, so I thought might as well make a video about it. I was also debating writing, um, making something about JAX, which is basically a combination of AutoCAD and uh, XLA. But unfortunately, JAX uh, has no Windows support, so and I don't have to compile it. Uh, I don't have time to compile it on Windows because I'll have to install uh, Visual Studio and so on. So I think PyTorch is a is a good alternative and. Um, and it's used a lot in research, so makes sense to do this. One one concern I had is like there are a lot of PyTorch video tutorials available. So, what value am I adding in this space? Most of the videos, or uh, most, or rather all of them that I've seen, they actually deal with some kind of application. So they will go over a bit of PyTorch and then you know make some application like the NS classifier or some RNN or LSTM network. I want to do a different job. I want to basically talk about PyTorch by itself. You know, I want to tell you the different ways to write a model, the different um, under the hood things that you can do with PyTorch, not focusing on applications. I will talk about applications, but that will be in the later half. I just want to delve into the depths of PyTorch and what you can do with it. And uh, we'll see how it goes. All right, so um, let's begin. Again, this series is meant for someone who already knows the theory of deep learning. I won't talk about you know what fully connected layers or what convolution layers are. There are tons of good videos on that, so feel free to check it out. This series is just dedicated on how to work with the PyTorch library. And uh, I plan on like getting to the into the nitty gritty de nitty gritty details of um, what happens under the hood of PyTorch. All right, um, sounds good. So let's first uh, see how to install PyTorch. Um, so I think they have a very nice installation manual here. Uh, rather, they have a very nice um, downloader, so you can choose which build you want, which operating system you have, um, which package manager you use. Um, again, uh, they, I think they have C++ bindings as well. What CUDA version you're using. So uh, I am not on my home machine, so I'll use uh, the CPU installation. So all you have to do is just copy this code in your terminal and install it. I already have it installed, so I won't show that. But uh, I recommend using um, one of the Python's virtual environment frameworks like Conda because that way you can have multiple versions of PyTorch installed and play with them. Now, installing PyTorch for GPU requires you to also install the CUDA framework. Uh, CUDA is the one specific to NVIDIA. ROCM is the one specific to AMD. Uh, AMD support right now is only limited to Linux. I don't know about Mac, but it's definitely not supported on Windows. Well, I guess you can do it using WSL too, but um, uh, yeah, I haven't tried it. And I don't have an AMD GPU, so I can't try it. But uh, CUDA requires you to install um, CUDA Toolkit and also CUDENN. So I'll make a separate video about it because uh, it's it's annoying and it's tricky. All right, so, uh, so for this particular video, the base one, I'm on Windows. The base installation that I chose was this particular one. So I get 1.9 CPU. And um, once I have it installed, I can just start working with PyTorch. So since this is the first video, I'll start small and I will talk about tensors. 
Now, um, here I have the doc page for tensors opened up. Tensors are the basic building blocks um, in any deep learning framework. Basically, a tensor is an n-dimensional array. So this is the ND array for NumPy or, or whatever framework you have. And um, a single value is also a tensor of dimension zero or one, however you want to count it. Um, and um, basically an image is a three dimensional tensor because it has height, width, channel. So uh, you can have, and then if you have multiple images that becomes a four dimensional ten tensor because the first three dimensions are occupied by a single image and the last dimension tells you how many images you have. So tensors are useful representation for, your for the data that you have. And um, so, an obvious question is why do we have tensors? Uh, I think even TensorFlow has tensors. Uh, so uh, I think, yeah, of course, uh, it's called tensors. So the additional advantage that tensors have over dealing with a um, regular array is that they contain some extra information. Now, in any deep learning framework, you need to store information about derivatives or how you've performed the computation. So this is the additional information that tensors can store. They store the computation graph. And so they, they store derivatives and the values of activation that can be used during the back propagation step. So that's the additional advantage. And then tensors can come in like all the different uh, data types that you can possibly imagine. So, um, the fact that they contain information about derivatives makes them super useful. And we will see how to use them. It also, they also have inbuilt functions for reshaping them. So, so it's rather pretty easy to use them. And um, yeah, so this huge page on uh, PyTorch documentation talks about all the stuff that you will probably use um, all the functions that support tensors, and it's a huge list. So I will only talk about the very important ones that that I use, or you will definitely use um, in your PyTorch life. So let me jump into a VS Code session. Sorry about the delay. I was struggling with OBS. All right. So um, I have a Jupyter Notebook opened up. I like to use VS Code for Jupyter Notebooks because it's nice. Um, you can check out my video on how to set up VS Code for Jupyter Notebooks. I think it should come somewhere. A link for it should be somewhere up top on the right. Um, OK, so let's first begin by importing a Torch or PyTorch. So notice the first thing is that it's called Torch because it's based on Torch and then Python is just an implementation of it. Or rather, um, it's, in, it's built on Python, so that's why it's called PyTorch. Um, okay, so we've imported, uh, we've imported um, Torch. Now, uh, let me double check the version that I'm using. So that can be queried by doing the dunder dunder version dunder dunder. And so I am using 1.9 on CPU. Good. Okay, so let us begin by first creating a tensor. <clears throat> so let me call it A, and then you call it by typing pt.tensor, and then let me make it a square matrix, two by two, so one comma two, and then two comma three. So this would create my tensor. That's the information you need to create a tensor. So now if I query it, you see that that's my tensor. So it's a two-dimensional tensor. How do I know it's dimensional two? If I query its size, oh, sorry, its shape, you see it's two comma two. So it's a two-dimensional tensor. Now, um, there are a lot of things that I can do. So the first one 
being probe the data type or set the data type and uh, let's first check what the data type is all right so and uh, so let's do that by using type that uh, tells you that it is uh, long now you can use type uh, in this fashion as well uh, really doesn't matter either way oh no it does matter because this type of a would just tell you that it's a tensor and then i would have to do a type to figure out uh, what's the actual data type now i can always set my data type let's say i want it to be a p32 so when i create the tensor i can give it a data type to be pt dot float 32 all right so now let's print out my tensor and you see they have been converted into floating values and then now if i do a type it tells me it's a float tensor let's see what happens if i do a 64 double tensor so float tensor is 32 uh double tensor is 64. let's see what if i do a 16. as you can see i'm also learning these things um now you see because it's not a default python data type uh when i print out a it tells me already this information about what's the type so half tensor all right good 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 so let's switch it back to 32. great all right now i can do any operation that i can do with any regular array or variable just like you do in numpy so if i do a times two it computes a times two now if i do a um, the square of it it computes that so um, this is an element wise square by the way so pretty awesome pretty and you can do it just so you can use this tensor the way you would use any numpy array so it's pretty versatile now I talked about the shape of this tensor so let me just see if everything is being captured correctly all right yeah so the shape was 2 comma 2 what if I wanted to flatten it out so a couple of important operations that you always use in deep learning is um, you reshape your array and then sometimes you flatten it out so that's one of the most important um, operation or rather one of the more important operations that you do on a tensor apart from the mathematical manipulations and um, let's first uh, do the flatten one so flatten converts an nd array, ND array into a one dimensional array it just flattens it out so if i do a dot flatten you'll see that it has become flat um, Oh, it's interesting. I choose one, two, two, three. I should have done one, two, three, four, but doesn't matter. Um, so you can see it's now a one-dimensional array. Now, a dot flatten returns a new tensor. So if you want to actually flatten your array, you would have to because you see a is unchanged. So you would have to do a equals a dot flatten. All right. Good. Now, so we've seen how to go from an ND array to a 1D array. Now let's see if I want a different shape. So in that case, you would use reshape. <clears throat> and the way reshape works is that you pass in the dimensions that you want uh, this two by two to be reshaped to. So let's say I want this two by two to be reshaped into a three dimensional array. And um, let's say I pass in the new dimensions um, 2 comma 2 so now my a has been reshaped into this particular pattern uh, I have to assign it so B equals a dot reshape and then if I do B dot shape you see it's 1 comma 1 comma 2 comma 2 so now I have a four dimensional array constructed from a two dimensional array notice the number of elements remains the same because if I multiply all of them together, I have four elements and I started with four elements. So that's one criteria for reshape. Um, you don't have to 
always specify all the elements. Let's say I specif specified 1, 1, 2, and then let's say this last I specify minus 1. What minus 1 means is basically compute whatever the remaining value is supposed to be. So you can always do minus 1 and it'll figure out, okay, so there are only, um, so I need to fill in with a 2 and it's the same. So that's um, an amazing thing about uh, this reshape operation that it can reshape your matrices or arrays or whatever you have into whatever dimension you want. Now, um, let's say now if I want to access the elements here, if I do B of zero, that gives me, uh, basically notice there are two square break brackets. So B of zero has dereference this one. So I would have to go further down the line. If I do B of zero comma zero, now I have, I've probed this much. Now, if I do a zero, I'll get one, two, the first row. And now if I go and do another zero, so I get a one back. So that's, that's how you would have to uh, basically refer to elements because now it's a four dimensional array. So you need the four dimensions. Um, that's, let's see if I can uh, get away with using commas. Yeah, I can use commas. All right, good. So, or you can use it like this. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's the same thing that's being computed. All right, so again, to refer it, I need four dimensions. In my original array, I only needed two dimensions because it was a two-dimensional array to refer to a single element. Right, so that's pretty much it for some basics, basic manipulations of tensors. Um, another way to manipulate tensors is using the dot view command. So if I do dot view, I do one comma minus one. That also does the same thing. Uh, so you can see that returns a new tensor with that with the uh, with the following shape. The w the difference between reshape and view is that view I think only works on the contiguous memory. So if you have a tensor that is laid out contiguously, uh, so only then view works. But um, reshape would work uh, no matter what. So I tend to use reshape more, but I think there might be some advantage or disadvantage of using both of them. Uh, last thing I want to do, I want to quickly go over the documentation for uh, these operations. So let me pull that up. All right, so here I have the documentation for view, and it talks about the condition that it needs for contiguity of the data. Um, I don't want to go into details of that in my first video, but um, when it's unclear to use view, just use reshape. And so I use reshape as a default. And uh, that's that's for the uh, function view. Now let's move over to flatten. So flatten takes in some arguments if you need, um, you know, which dimension you want to flatten first or where you start want to start from. So that's for flatten. And the remaining one is reshape, which is basically how I um, uh, talked about how it will be returned. Now, again, there's a lot more detail to, you know, performance difference between reshape and view, but I am not going to go into that in my first video, but we will delve into all of that in the later videos. So um, I hope you liked this first video. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it for this. In the next video, I'll talk about uh, how to do differentiation using tensors, because that's the main use of tensors, or that's, the, that's where all these deep learning libraries shine. So I will see you guys next time. All right, bye.